Hey guys, this is Will from Monkey Steals Peach here. For today's video, I want to talk about the changes that martial arts underwent in the early 20th century in China. So there were two, basically there were two sort of associations that were largely responsible for this change. The first one was the Jingwu Athletic Association, uh, headed by Huo Yunjia, which I talked about in a video a while ago when I went to visit there headquarters uh, here in Shanghai. The other association was the uh, Zhongyang Guoshu Guan, which means the Central Martial Art Association. And while in Southeast Asia and overseas, the Jingwu probably had more lasting influence, within China itself, the Guoshu Guan was definitely the one that had the biggest impact uh, that you can still feel up until today. If you're a practitioner of most Chinese martial arts, particularly the ones that come from the eastern sort of coastal region, then definitely the Guo Shu Guan has impacted the way you train, the way your system set up, pretty much every aspect of it. The Guo Shu Guan was officially sanctioned by the Guomindang nationalist government that were ruling China at the time, and its purpose was to standardize. Um, modernize and popularize Chinese martial arts in the country and they, they really sort of took their model from the Japanese Budo movement which had very similar goal over in Japan. During the Qing dynasty all aspects of Chinese culture were divided between Wen which means uh, liter uh, like literature, cultural, civil pursuits, politics, whatever and Wu, which means martial or military. So everything was divided into these two categories. And because the ruling imperial family were, were Manchu, which were nomadic people from the far northeast, they were considered by the Han people to be sort of oppressive, but at the same time to be barbaric and culturally inferior to the Han Chinese. Um, the Manchu people, uh, being nomadic placed a lot of emphasis on having their men learn things like horse riding, archery, wrestling, you know, to take part in great big hunts, things like that. So the Han Chinese regarded a cultivated man to be the complete antithesis of this, which was that, you know, that's where the stereotype of the sort of the weak, frail, uh, Matt, you know, bookworm sort of huddled over old scrolls reciting Confucius comes from. It really comes, comes from that disdain for the Manchu rulers. And so once the Guomindang took power and China became a republic, they, they really thought that this ideal was holding the nation back. You know, people were overly superstitious and sort of too obsessed with holding on to these outdated traditions. So they created a movement called Xin Xionghua, which means new life. And this was to promote, you know, modern ideas of hygiene, to sort of get rid of these superstitious ideas, you know, to get people to sort of modernize and move forward in, in the world and to accept Western technology and science. And a big part of this was also the Tiyu Huodong, which means the physical education movement. And that's where the martial arts fits in. You see, as I mentioned, the Wu or martial aspect of Chinese culture was sort of discriminated or sort of looked down upon in, in, in late imperial China. Martial artists were stereotyped as being bandits, bodyguards, low lives, you know, people that would perform you know, brick breaking in, in the market to earn a bit of money you know, th things like that. So the Tiyu Huodong, the physical education movement, had various factions and some people, including the famous Chinese writer Lu Xun, they thought that martial arts should just be completely got rid of. There was no place for martial arts in modern China. This was something outdated. It was superstitious. It was stupid. And they thought that Chinese people should just accept Western athletics, Western ideals of sportsmanship. And they, you know, they were promoted athletics, football, 
things like that. You know, these were things that were popular in the Christian missions that were set up in China at the time as well. But then there was the other group, the other faction that wanted to reform Chinese martial arts. And they recognized this, this great body of traditional knowledge regarding physical education. And they realized that if they could just modernize it, standardize it somewhat, they could make it more acceptable to the general public. You know, take away this this concept that it's something, you know, ruffians are using it to fight each other in the street and promote this idea of Changshan Jianti, which is like, you know, strong and healthy body. You know, using it to to strengthen the young people and also to cultivate their spirit, you know, make them tougher and you know, greater patriotic citizens. And so they set they set about reforming and, and that's where the Jingwu and the Guo Shuguan came in here. So what the Guo Shuguan did was they they set up their headquarters in Nanjing and then they had branches in all of the provincial capitals around China and sort of sub branches of that in other cities as well. So they, they really spread all over China. They invited a lot of the best martial artists from all over China from every style to come and teach. The only prerequisite was that you believed these new values. And so they divided the martial arts between two categories. There was what they categorized as Shaolin styles, which were the so-called external or Waijia styles. And those were the ones that relied a lot on physical strength, you know, where you built your body up to be strong and they were, you know, hard and tough. And then there was the Wu Dang, or the, you know, uh, styles which were the, the internal or Nei styles. And those were the ones that were, you know, softness overcomes hardness and developing your internal qi and these sort of more esoteric ideas. So the Shaolin category was headed by Wang Ziping, who was a Chinese Muslim from Tangzhou in Hebei province. He was a practitioner of Cha Chuan, which is a long fist style, and a, a well-known strongman in China at the time. There's a lot of stories about him. I'm going to make a future video about that. And then Sun Lutang, of course, he was really, really famous for his writings as well as his Taiji Xingyin Ba Gua. He was the head of the Wu Dang category. I just want to mention here that there's absolutely no connection between what they termed as Wudang styles in Guo Shuguan and Wudang Mountains. That was a, a myth that came about later. And if you're interested in that, I've actually done a video over on my Patreon. You can check that out, patreon.com slash monkeysteelspeech. There's a video where I talk about the Wudang myth. So the Guo Shuguan was really quite short lived. It closed down in 1937 with the Japanese invasion of Nanjing and they could never really get the funds to restart again. But with the communist takeover of China in 1949 and the Kuomintang fleeing to Taiwan and setting up their government there, a lot of the prominent figures of the Guo Shuguan uh, were invited by the Kuomintang government to, to flee to Taiwan with them. And so that's why there was this great exodus of martial artists to Taiwan. It's not that people, it's not that martial artists were fleeing because they were persecuted for practicing martial arts per se, it was more about their political affiliations. Of course, martial arts were persecuted by the communists, but the fact was a lot of the martial artists who were not politically affiliated, they just stayed in China and went underground. You know, A lot of them were too poor to have made the move anyway. Okay, so I hope that helped put things into perspective. It's important to understand where things came from to understand and, and realize why they are the way they are today. The Guo Shuguan was heavily influential on almost all martial arts that we practice today and this emphasis on them being more about health and strengthening the Chinese nation, this nationalist sort of ideals, has really shaped martial arts and how they are. So I hope that gave you a little bit of an insight. And you should also go and check the Jingwu video 
that I did earlier that talks about Pu Yun Jia and the Jingwu Association because that's also very related to this. So yeah, if you liked it, please like this video, subscribe and check out my other videos. If you want to support the running of this channel, you can go to patreon.com slash monkeysteelspeach. There's a load of extra footage from the previous interviews I've done. There's also other talks and things where I go more into depth about some topics. And there will be a lot more footage from the interviews that I'm going to be doing later this year uh, over this summer. So yeah, that you know your support there will really help make those videos a reality. So yeah, thank you very much and see you next time.